afternoon, everyone. Welcome. I, I'm, I'm Sunny Katwar. I'm the director of British Future. Welcome to this British Future and Policy Exchange event, Uniting Our Communities Integration in 2013. We're delighted to be hosting together the uh, first major speech of the, of the new year by um, Eric Pickles, Secretary of State for Community and Local Government. This is also the, the week that marks the uh, first birthday of British Future, uh, which uh, a year ago we were, we were just launching and beginning to debate. And what, what we were hoping to do was provide a, a new voice and new voices into our national conversations about uh, who we are, who we want to be, who we wanted to be. And 2012 is obviously a very, very good year for us to do that. We're particularly interested in reaching audiences that don't come to speeches and think tanks and academic debates, important though those are, but reaching broad public audiences. And especially for us, not reaching audiences that are already confident about modern Britain, but reaching audiences that aren't. And finding out how people who feel confident about the way our society has changed and our diversity, and people who are anxious about that, can work together on what we're going to do to make sure the society that we share works. So today's theme of integration in 2013 uh, is a very important way for us to take that forward. I just want to look back very briefly at last year, which uh, in lots of ways was, a, was an incredible year. And one of one of the highlights for us was the was the street party we held uh, on the Friday of the Jubilee. So I just want to show you uh, a short ITV news film that evening of, of the street party we held. the food from the Middle East, and the guests from every corner of the globe. This was a jubilee party which confirmed London as a melting pot of cultures and a protector for those who need it most. This weekend is about celebrating Britishness. One of the things that really makes Britain great is that for the last 60 years, we've given protection to people who have violence and persecution. We've given protection and they've made an amazing contribution back. I've been asked several questions over the years about what I feel, do I feel British, do I feel Indian, do I feel whatever. Like many of his fellow Indians, Cyrus Todiwana came to London not as a refugee but to work. He's now a successful chef and kick-started the Queen's Diamond Jubilee tour by cooking lunch for her and the Duke of Edinburgh. I cook Indian food as you would expect, but I cook what is called a country captain. And uh, it's been published in a book now to celebrate the Diamond Jubilee. And the country captain is the Indian version of the shepherd's pie. Was it five years? Did she like it? She loved it. She finished every morsel, which is what made it so great for me. Habiba Mohammed is originally from Somalia, but came to the UK from Kenya to live with her husband. When their marriage broke down because of domestic violence, she was left destitute. England being to me, it's a lot, because right now I can't go back to my country, because my family now, they're against me because I left my husband. And uh, I tried to explain to them what the problem was. But in my culture, they don't accept a woman who is divorced or separated from her husband. Habiba was one of the new arrivals. Others had come halfway through the Queen's reign. And in Paul Sassia Satan's case, had made it from refugee to mayor and now a borough councillor. I came here in 1985 as a refugee. And today I'm here to celebrate uh, the Queen's Diamond Jubilee. It's an important event for us because uh, it's an opportunity for us to say thanks to the Queen for the wonderful 60 years. There are refugees here from every generation since the Queen has been on the throne. And one of the things they plan to do for her is sign that giant telegram which thanked her for giving them sanctuary here in the UK. And for those who were here during the Queen's Silver Jubilee, a chance to recreate a photograph taken then. They had all been given a chance to rebuild their lives. Artist Imad Altay sought haven in London after fleeing Iraq. Others were from Uganda, Zimbabwe and even Tibet. What they all had in common was their gratitude and their determination to make the most of the opportunity. Roque Phillips, London Tonight, Brixton. So many of us, I think, felt that 2012 was a year when we could find a shared pride in Britain, whether it was the Jubilee, the Olympics, 
and the other events. I think the question we face now is how, in 2013, can we take that forward in our communities? Delighted to welcome, ladies and gentlemen, Eric Pickles to that discussion today. Well, thank you very much. I'm particular. I thank you for the latecomers who managed to fill uh, the <laughs> early part. Um, years ago, when um, Lena Brezhnev was still alive, I visited the Soviet Union and was taken by officers of the Komsomol, which was a young communist, to a, a, um, a circus, a Moscow circus. And um, the party membership um, uh, seats were always just a little bit back there, not at the front. And I said, why? He said, just in case there are some unfortunate accidents. <laughs> <laughs> I think you should be kind of okay during this. <laughs> Well, I don't think, uh, as we saw in the film, I don't think we we're ever going to forget 2012. Uh, uh, Jubilee Jamboree, street parties, uh, music marathons. And that special uh, magic of the Olympics and the Paralympics, Gold Rush. And we haven't, I think, seen the light uh, before compressed into a, a, a single year. When you look back, what strikes me is how those events were illuminated by millions of small, intense sparks. Sparks of kindness, sparks of service. It was a year when volunteering uh, went to Vogue, when the biggest army of volunteers for nearly 70 years made things go with a zing and when the loudest cheer at the Olympic Stadium went to the Games makers. 2012 was also a year when striving people who had struggled to be heard finally found their voice. This was brought home to me uh, by a story I heard about Nazrin from Keithley in Yorkshire, the place in which I was born and brought up. Nazrin came to Keithley a quarter of a century ago from Pakistan. She'd always struggled uh, to pick up the language. Things changed when a very thoughtful neighbour invited her to a mums and tolerance group at the local church. A group that happened to be supported by our near neighbours initiative. It proved to Nazrin to be a turning point with the encouragement of her new friends, she plucked up the courage to enrol at a local college to learn English. She's now fluent, nothing can stop her. She's even completed a food hygiene course so she can give something back to the new friends that helped her. Nazarene's victory, her intense spark of success, triumphing against the odds, should be cheered from the rafters just as much as the achievements of the magnificent Mo Farah. But her victory shows why we are determined to back local ambition. Every person is a vital part of their community. And when you improve the, when you improve the life of one person, you begin to improve the lives of those around them. We saw this time and time again last year. Take the organisation called The Big Lunch. This was about bringing millions together to enjoy a cuppa, maybe a cake, or on a picnic table. Once a community picnic becomes a gathering of neighbours, once you can put a name to a face, you start getting things done, as Peter from North Fleet in Kent discovered. By the time he'd finished his meal, he gathered more than 90 signatures on a petition for a new zebra crossing near his local primary school. You break down barriers and good deeds lead to one another. It's the same uh, with the British uh, uh, bandstand uh, marathon. We helped 200,000 people boogie to the beat. Now let's face it, the great and the good and the rest of us, we all like to boogie. But I love the fact that local people went further, ingeniously devising the uh, instrument uh, amnesty. 
So instead of getting rid of old banjos or accordions, unused instruments, went to others who wanted to learn to play. The Jubilee Hour also offered a perfect demonstration of integration in action. Millions gave 60 minutes to mark 60 years of service by Her Majesty. And just like Her Majesty, they often went above <coughs> and beyond. Hardy folk at Broadbottom cleared glass from a small river beach. Birmingham volunteers tidied up the gardens of a local care home. For many, what started as an hour's volunteering looks like turning into a lifetime's commitment. Members of the Military Preparation College have decided to volunteer about 10,000 hours annually to benefit local communities. And while we're on the subject of helping people to do things themselves, we're ensuring youngsters from all backgrounds match skills to their ambition. I visited Safeside, an education facility in Birmingham, to see Youth United in action a group of St John's Ambulance Volunteers teaching other young folk how to give CPR. In return, gaining confidence and experience that would directly help them in the jobs market. It was a life-saving course in more ways than one. When you bring together all these intense sparks of commitment and community, what you get is a glowing sense of pride, a real tangible sense of belonging to our country. The 2011 census said that we are more and more becoming a cosmopolitan uh, country. What 2012 demonstrated that we can celebrate the common threads that unite us. Last year, we seized back the Union flag from thugs and extremists. Not just the loutish EDL, but the equally vile poppy burners both flaming the flames of hatred, spreading fear, clanging their discordant bell of division. In 2012, we won the argument. Where they sought to divide, we sought to unite. Where they tried to pull down the shutters, we put out the bunting. Where they sought to brick Britain in, we built Britain up. These extremists want Britain to return to a place and a time that never existed. And if it had, it would be a nasty, brutish and mean place. But I think we've shown that their faces don't fit and they're not welcome in a modern Britain. And that's a relief for taxpayers. For the past few years, we've had to stomp up the cost of policing the EDL and their malevolent marches. But two, just two of these demonstrations in Luton staggeringly cost almost £2.4 million. Pounds. They left the local authority with very little change out of £200,000. The money that could have been spent on community policing or solving crime. What's more, these demonstrations dealt a devastating blow to business and to shops on the high street. Luton's local shopping centre lost an estimated half a million pounds. And that doesn't even take into consideration the losses of local stores, companies and local taxi firms first. Demonstrations in Bradford, my old much-loved city, left businesses out of pocket to the tune of over a million pounds. It cost £650,000 to police a thousand protesters. Now, I don't know about you, but £650 per protester doesn't sound like value for money to me. Now, of course, it's wonderful to live in a society where people feel able to protest. And the usual inconvenience is a small price to pay for such rights. But in times of austerity, we simply cannot afford to subsidise this is insignificant, malignant minority. Holding thriving businesses to hostage, 
hostages to hate. When process happens, week in, week out, it numbs communities, blights people, place that they call home, turns neighbourhoods into sinister arenas for conflict and for hostility. You know, you should be able to go pop out to the chemist, or be able to let your kids go shopping in the high street on a Saturday afternoon without having to check the calendar to see if the EDL are on the march. Every community has a basic right to sleep soundly in their beds and to walk without fear on their streets. And I'm glad to see the EDL numbers on the slide. Now, for some, our approach to integration is a little too simple. They want a, a Stalinist five-year plan. They want to tell people what to do and what to think. They believe in focus groups, the graph, the beanbag, the diversity questionnaire. Precisely the sort of box-ticking exercise that leads to more bureaucracy, not more unity. Policymakers of the past prefer to fund ethnic groups to help ethnic groups, instead of supporting neighbours to meet neighbours. Yet the distractors have been bowled over by the success that we've had on the ground. It's a success that's been based in the real world. Success founding on an understanding that integration occurs locally and can't be imposed by Whitehall. Those who came to this country uh, from the Jews of the East End to uh, Leicester's Ugandans, they didn't abandon their heritage or culture, but they were able to make a success of their lives. They understand that what makes you British has nothing to do with the colour of your skin, the nature of your religion. It's not where you come from, it's where you're going that matters. And that's why they adopted the great things this country has to offer, our great British liberties, like the respect for free speech, even if you don't agree with what has been said, respect for the law. And it also comes out as things people consider most important about Britain in today's British pu uh, future whole. And of course, these um, <coughs> communities uh, have um, embraced those other intangible parts of our constitution. These liberties that existed long before um, European judges were ever less loose on the issue. It's our great sense of tolerance of fair play, respect for others. It's our willingness and their ambition, their determination to come to the party, to grab the success, to pick up a dictionary rather than relying on a translator, that made them a vital part of the British family. So when it comes to integration, our priority is to make way, remove the bureaucracy, snap the shackles of the PC brigade, and let lo localism loose. Use people powered so communities can do things themselves. Our support for troubled families, community budgets, neighbourhood planning are clear examples of this approach. And the old Whitehall walls have come down. Local government fault lines have been erased. Instead, we're getting organisations together to tackle deep-rooted social problems. We're removing the dependence from the system and giving local people confidence to strengthen their communities. In 2012, we discovered, to quote uh, the chief rabbi, music beneath our nose. And in 2013, we won't skip a beat of that music. We'll keep breaking down the barriers that get in the way of people getting together. Language is our starting point. I began by talking about uh, my fellow uh, resident of Keithley, as I But she's not alone. Far too many people have paid the price for another one of the old Stalinist policies. 
the decision to pay for translation instead of trusting people to learn the language. It's been estimated that the public sector spends as much as £140 million pounds a year translating documents into foreign languages. Now, it wasn't that our predecessors were ill-intended, don't get me wrong there. I think their hearts were in the right place. It's just the decisions were simply wrong. It made matters worse. It entrenched divisions, slamming shut the door of opportunity. So let us, uh, so let us to um, an incomprehensible situation where no one can speak English as their main language in 5% of our households. That's terrible for community relations and bad news for the taxpayer. And it was good to listen recently to an apology for these poor policy choices. <coughs> it's just a pity that it came 15 years too late. We want people to get along, to make sense. They have to speak English. People should be able to talk and understand one another in a nuanced way. I'm not expecting everybody to get the lyrical dexterity of Samuel Johnson, or for that matter, Boris Johnson. <laughs> but it's about getting the best from all of our citizens. Britain is a country built on aspirations. You work hard to get your first job, your first car, your first home. But the reality is you need English to succeed. You can't really function as a good doctor, a good teacher, or a good mechanic. And since we're in the Institute of Civil Engineering, you can't be a good uh, engineer if you can't talk the language. Just as, you can't, just as you can't talk to your neighbor, read a bus timetable, or enjoy the, the enormous joy of the only way is Essex. Worse still, our kids, who aren't fluent in English are condemned to a very limited life. We don't want people's identity to disappear or to cease to be proud of their roots or their background. We want them to stay in touch with their culture. We want them to be proud and ambitious. So learning English is an integral part of that process. That's why, instead of millions lost in translation services, Next year we're ploughing millions into the English language service. Today I'm launching a competition that will allow local communities to tailor language services to suit their needs of their area. And we'll give people the power to improve their circumstances and to climb the social ladder. But more than that, it will benefit Britain. We'll all miss out. Our country is a poor if people can't speak our language, if they're unable to participate or make an economic contribution. <coughs> England is the, is the passport to prosperity all over the world. From Mumbai to Beijing, ambitious parents are trying to get their children to learn English. We should want no less for our children here. And we need to ensure the intense spark of ambition <coughs> is felt strongly right across the country. We need our great communities to succeed, for Britain to succeed. When they do well, our country is enriched culturally and economically. Ultimately, Britain can only compete on the global race if we realise the full potential of each and every person in our country. Another unintended consequence of the previous administration was the attitude to uncontrolled uh, immigration. Because it put a strain on our schools, our health care and welfare. Besides the social tension it also created, was that it shifted a real opportunity for us to develop our own homegrown talent. British Asian uh, cuisine is a classic example of this. We all know that curry is a favourite item on the menu of people up and down the land. 
it warms the cockles of 2.5 million people every week, bringing billions into our economy. It also reminds us of a way that we've taken to our traditional dish. I've added, I suppose, our own unique British twist. Yet I can't understand why many chefs were imported from Bangladesh for this purpose, when we had <coughs> and should have done more to train local people up to that level of, um, uh, of cuisine. That's why I am as keen as Koma on the curry schools. <laughs> We're helping us to put domestic glitz and glamour back into the industry and able us to develop a new uh, generation of master chefs, new Atul Kuchars, to export to India and the rest of the world. A desire to improve social mobility is all our citizens, is a factor I've identified as integral to integration last year. And it's more than about Kerry schools. We're encouraging at least 50 more schools to take part in enterprise challenges. And we're winning hundreds more secondary school pupils to work placements in industry. We're also moving forward another element of our strategy of participation. Our faith communities, our past masters are bringing people together. Now, also from Keithley, Alistair Campbell might cap on and say we definitely might cap on, but we definitely do God. Faith provides a clear moral compass and a call to action that benefits society as a whole. At a time when Christians are under attack for their beliefs in different parts of the world, I'm proud <coughs> of the freedom of belief in Britain. But in a recent year-long standing British liberties of freedom of religion have been undermined by intolerance and aggressive secularism taking people to task for wearing the cross or a rosary, beginning costly legal actions against council prayers as if people had nothing better to do. We're committed to the right of Christians and people of all beliefs to follow their faith openly, wear religious symbols and pray in public. That's why I signed a parliamentary order last year to protect the freedom for communities to pray. I am delighted with the principle of wearing a religious symbol of work as today being upheld by the European Court. It's a very long judgment. Um, our lawyers are ploughing through. The Prime Minister promised that we would change the law if necessary. The lawyers are still ploughing through the judgment, uh, but their preliminary view is it isn't going to be necessary to change uh, the law and the protection um, is there. Our year of service reminded us why faith still counts. Christians at Harvest Festival, Muslims at Eid, Jews at Mitzvah Day, Sikhs on the martyrdom of Guru Anjan Dav, all reaching across the divide, seeking succour to the sick, support for the needy, to the poor of all faiths and to people of no faith. Faith galvanises communities. That's why we will very soon be announcing our plans to build on the success of a year of service. Plans that make the most of the energy and the enthusiasm of all those who took part in faith-based volunteering last year. Alongside this, I'll be supporting a further 190 near-neighbour projects to keep communities connecting. Participation stems from what last year I referred to as sharing common ground. Last year was about celebration. Next year will be about commemoration. On the ceiling of this great hall, uh, this building's great hall, which you'll have an opportunity to have a look at uh, later, is a painted memorial uh, to the war to end all wars. It's a, a reminder of the enormous sacrifice of those who forgot who fought and uh, died for this country in a conflict that began 99 years ago. They were made up of all creeds, all colours, all classes, and came from all parts of the world. 
Last November, as I stood by the cenotaph, it occurred to me that this was the first time that we stood in silence without a World War I veteran by our side. But we will continue to remember them. And this year, our uh, preparations to honour the fallen will pick up pace. Few people have a greater sense of responsibility than our brave armed forces. And it's been another of my priorities to build that sense of responsibility, particularly among our young people. That's why we've encouraged tens of thousands of youngsters to join the National Citizen Service. And that will continue. And we'll also be helping hundreds of young people to get involved in great activities such as scouts and industrial cadets, helping break down barriers while having a bit of fun at the same time. Finally, if we are to encourage people to get on board, we've got to be very clear we need to tell some people where to get off. As we, as we did last year, we will continue to work to isolate extremism. Twenty years on from the death of Stephen Lawrence, we continue to show racism the red car, working with 10,000 students in schools across the country to reject the extremist message. And special interest groups led by Blackburn and Luton councils have undertaken important work locally to tackle these fanatics. We're watching out for their findings with great interest. Meanwhile, we've put uh, into monitoring anti-Muslim attacks, MAMA, and it will lay the foundation for reporting and gathering data on anti-Muslim incidents. There can be no hiding place for the racist in our society. So in 2013, our mantra is a simple one. Integration, integration, integration. We will continue reaching hard across the divide. We will continue forging friendships that strengthen our society and help everyone get on with life. But if I had one New Year's resolution for this year, it would be to make this year, like the title of the book I've just downloaded on my Kindle, a year of doing good, because it's in those intense sparks of ambition that will light the way for our country. These intense sparks will weld us together as a stronger nation in the years and the decades to come. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Secretary of State. I'm, I'm keen to just get a few uh, questions there. I know the time is quite tight. Let me, um, so do signal please if you've got something to ask. I'd like to uh, ask David Skelton uh, from Pulse Exchange, our co-host, uh, because obviously uh, we're going to be the first question of this. Um, thank you very much, Leila. That was a very, very important speech. I um, agree very much about the important success of 2012, particularly the share that entity that came through London 2012 and the Jubilee very clearly. Um, Something that was said was about the importance of the English language, the importance of teaching the English language um, to new immigrants and ensure that everybody can speak English. And there's also maybe something about ensuring integration happens at, at an earlier age as possible. Um, so from early years through primary school, ensuring that integration happens there. Just hoping you could say a little bit more about the efforts to spread the English language amongst immigrant groups. Thank you. Let me, let, me, let me take one or two more. Do we have anyone else wanting to come in on the question of English language specifically, which was a significant theme? I'll, I'll take, a, take a, a point there. Um, 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 one of them. Um, on the point of English. Tell us who you are, thank you. Say that again? Tell us who you are. Well. Um, Ishan Akbar uh, from local government. Um, on the point of English language, the only point I want to make is I want to put it to you that perhaps translation helps with that transition for a certain period. You completely strip it from the beginning. It makes it very difficult for people to understand in public life what's happening. And there's a quotation on the, on the flag there. Uh, <clears throat> it's all out. Uh, yeah, do. Go ahead. Um, Andy Thornton from the Citizenship Foundation. Um, thank you, that's fabulous. Can I just ask a point of clarity? I think I heard you say 5% of households in the UK have no one that can speak English. Yeah, as their main language. As their main language. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, did I have any, did say one more point on English language if someone has a specific point mm -hmm. about, mm -hmm. about, about this, this uh, one in the middle there? Actually, uh, teaching English requires an investment of resources. Is there, in a, in, when you announce a competition, does that involve uh, new resources for the teaching of English <coughs> language? And is there any consideration to uh, really thinking hard about the methodologies that are used to enable people to learn English much more quickly? Let's just take a point next to you. Let's just start hand up. I want, uh, one of the you say who you are, then? My name's Jill Rutter, and I'm Vice Chair of the Migration Museum, but I've also written a lot about English language learning. One of the uh, biggest migratory movements has been, uh, in recent years, has been the movement of workers from the new member states of the European Union who are largely working long hours, uh, maybe in the country for quite a short length of time. Uh, I wondered if you could say something about encouraging this group, uh, their language fluency, and uh, to respond to the criticism that we have very little leadership from central government in terms of getting English language classes out to workers and encouraging greater employer responsibility in uh, facilitating workers learning English. Uh, how do you get people who work long hours, how do you encourage them to learn English? And how do you encourage them without much uh, leadership from central government? Thank you, sir. a very uh, reasonable point. First of all, stop seeing, stop seeing groups as immigrants. There has been a, a wave of immigration, of course. And if it was just about um, immigration, then you know that in a way is something that's very easy. The real worry thing is that we saw surveys last year. I got a little bit of trouble, and uh, let me repeat that trouble for myself. This is possibly controversial. I said that we have people going through the entire system not able to speak English like a native. I want to define what I think um, and. Uh, um, a British native is. A British native is somebody who um, is white. A British native is somebody who is Sikh. A British native is somebody who is Muslim. A British na native is someone who is Jewish. A British na a native is above all somebody who has chosen to live here. And the reason why I'm keen is the nuances. Now, pretty carefully said it, but not you can't be a good mechanic. Well, come on, you can. You can deal with um, uh, with a cow without having to talk to anybody. Well, not really. You want to be able to talk to the driver and the customer. You want to be able to talk to somebody in the supermarket or in or um, uh, uh, the bus stop or in the train station. You want to be able to um, um, watch the news, see what's going on. You want to be able to um, penetrate someone of my. Uh, uh, dubious accent and understand what, we, what, what I'm saying. It's all about working together. Now, you know, confession time. I was very much involved, I've been involved in this uh, a good many years, and I can recall the enormous worries. The uh, point we're making, the point about transition, I've heard before, and um, I've kind of agreed with it. I got talked into when I was education chairman in Bradford into teaching maths and teaching other subjects in a mother tongue language in order that kids didn't fall behind. And uh, the results were pretty good. But it doesn't help in the long term. It doesn't help. Um, you know, the way to learn, um, I'm trying to learn Spanish at the moment, and the way to learn it is, is kind of immersion. And uh, immersion, in, uh, immersion into a real life situation. Now, I've known friends who've tackled this in, a different, uh, in, in different ways. I've known friends who've insisted on just speaking English at home in front of their children. There are different ways of doing it. The competition is about trying to get that teaching into the community. You know, you want to be able to teach kids a good language uh, in schools. 
we want to ensure that mum and dad can speak as well, so they can so they can check what's happening, so they can keep at pace, so they can make sure that the homework's being done, so they can be part of of a wider uh, wider community. Now, the point you're making about various people coming from oh dear, hopefully we'll be able to get that back later. Um, <laughs> The point about people come from, uh, from different countries, well, it, it, is, it is wonderful uh, to um, ensure that those folks can speak English. But I'm interested in somebody who is saying, this is my home. This is where I'm going to live. This is where I'm going to bring my kids up. This is where I, my, my leisure time is going to be spent. And I don't want to have communities that can't speak to one another. And the most amazing thing about <coughs> the process of integration, I think, is that when suddenly your neighbour becomes much more familiar, and that can only come uh, through, uh, through speaking the same language, I think it's a great unifier. I don't want to diminish in any way whatsoever our Jewish communities, our Hindu communities, our Sikh communities, uh, our, our Muslim communities. I want them to feel proud of their, of their heritage. But I also want them to feel that holding that heritage dear and tight also means they are full participating British citizens. Thank you, thank you, sir. Let me squeeze in one or two questions for us here. This will be the last round. Um, there's a hand up there. Uh, next. Yes. Um, Jeremy Thomas, Cardiff Trustees. Um, thank you for your talk. If we're to, um, if we're to, to make Britain and keep Britain a confident cosmopolitan society and thus become a truly united kingdom as we need to be, you mentioned the centenary of the First World War next year. What can we do to use that as a ceremony, not, uh, as, um, a ceremony not simply of commemoration, but of reconciliation, and thus uh, to work against all forms of xenophobia, all forms of prejudice, um, so that we can uh, live quietly and happily and constructively in this country together? Well, we were very keen on uh, this process. It is this desire to commemorate the First World War. It's not something that's just shared by the United Kingdom. It's also felt very strongly um, in, um, in France and in, uh, in Russia and particularly in Germany. And the last thing we want to do is to create some of the jingoistic natures. But it was um, a great turning point for our nation. The level of prosperity that existed um, in Edwardian Britain was not going to be replicated until quite early in the 1950s. It was, um, uh, there's a wonderful book about the uh, First uh, World War. I'm sorry, I've just had a, um, so I can't remember the, um, the, uh, the author. And there's a, a, a phrase there that talks about. Edwardian England walking out of those trenches, uh, kicking a ball, um, marching towards the German uh, trenches, and it said that Britain would never have the same confidence again. And uh, I mean, I can, I'm, I'm from obviously, kind of get, get a kind of guess, I'm from the north of England. <laughs> but the impacts that the First World War had on the north of England with those palace regiments where people recruited from, from streets and served together. You know, the effect that he had on places like Accrington and Leeds and Bradford. And I can remember as a very uh, young child wondering why my, uh, I had so many aunts who, 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 who never got married because a whole generation were just simply taken out. Now, you know, a lot of people from the Indian subcontinent served um, in, the, in the trenches. And it's kind of interesting that all those folks who served there, their descendants, chosen to come and live in the United Kingdom. So, in a way, there, there is a way in which we can celebrate the cosmopolitan 
nature of British society through the sacrifice that our great, well, in my case, my grandfather, and I suspect in most cases here, uh, your great grandfather made. Mm. Sounds like that, yeah. Excellent. Uh, Unmeshka Sai, new councillor, cabinet member for crime and antisocial behaviour, and also leading the prevent agenda. Eric, I agree with much of what you said, um, but I really got to put this question to you. In New York, we only translate when it's absolutely necessary. There's, there is a statutory duty upon us. Our public space, we only use it for events that bring people together. We only fund events and use public money that <coughs> bring people together. No more separate communities. And we also believe strongly in mixed housing and building mixed communities in practice. But, but at the same time, this needs a national framework. Now, you, from, as I understand your speech, you put the focus of the onus onto local authorities, and we will take our share of responsibilities. But it does need a clear national lead, because otherwise, especially in the North, too many local authorities of all parties, all political persuasions, are still, I'm afraid, following the te what Ted Kenton said many years ago, sleepwalking into segregation. Yes. But, uh, secondly, uh, again, this is slightly depressing, schooling. It's too many of the university areas, even in our own borough, you go to schools, and 90% of the school kids are from one particular community. I went to a conference in Windsor recently, organized by Damos, I think David is here somewhere. Shatan Mahathur's prevent me from identifying the person who said this. But is it too extreme a solution to talk about things like busing? Because until we get kids of different communities, nationalities, <coughs> religions, and races mixing together from a very early age, how the earth can we tolerate the situation where 90, 95% of, of kids in, in primary school uh, in particular are from, uh, uh, from one particular uh, uh, called, uh, 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 community? And thirdly, what has been missing in this whole debate, and also from the case that was shown right at the beginning, is the role of the majority of the community, white indigenous working class communities, who very rightly, or rightly or wrongly, have this sense of grievance, they're missing out on housing, their culture, their identity, as they perceive is being taken away, they're the most important part of the solution. For too many years, if you're not politically correct in New York at all, I can assure you, Eric, they're not politically correct at all. Too much public money has gone down into the wrong avenues, wrong channels, until we do programs, particularly address the issue of housing, poor housing, social housing, and bring communities together and address the alienation that prevails among the white indigenous working class communities. We will unfortunately allow people like the EGL, uh, you, uh, uh, the BNK, and I'm afraid, the hard right wing populism of UKIP, that is what the danger is going to come to us. Thank, thank you, Mr. Well, to make that the last, uh, the last question, but uh, say, just, uh, I'm wondering on, on segregated uh, schools, I mean, do, do you nudge and you do encourage, or do you, do, can you do more than that? Well, I, um, I, I want to tell a couple of them. I, I agree with a fair bit of, of what was just uh, said in terms of identifying uh, the, the problem. With regards specifically statutory duties to translate, I think we'll do our best to relieve you of that. Um, I think we will uh, ensure that uh, uh, you can concentrate on teaching uh, English as a good language. Now look, someone once asked me um, what was proudest of was being a councillor. And one of the proudest things I did was um, uh, we had a city technology college in Bradford. And um, but we weren't on the original list at all. And I had to really sort of get on my knees and go see Ken Baker, sweet talking me to having a college and, and I went to see Stanley Carnes at Dixon and talked him into bankrolling it and, <coughs> and I remember going back uh, and uh, seeing my um, director of education and he was a lovely lad but the first six months I thought uh, his office was actually the staff room because he loved to sit on a beanbag and uh, it's never come natural to me to sit on a beanbag. And I explained what I'd done. He wasn't terribly excited about it. And he said, where are you going to put it? And um, I said, we're going to put it in Newby Square, which was named after an old corrupt Labour councillor. <laughs> um, to add people to it. And he said, you can't possibly put it there. Because who goes there? Poor, uh, poor blacks and poor whites. And they, and they won't know what to do with the choice. And we kind of made a simple choice, which was for uh, people had to wear a uniform, which was actually just a jumper and, and slacks. And, people, and, and parents had to guarantee that the kids would do their homework. And what we created there, right in the middle of the city, was a place of excellence that people wanted to come to. And I think what we, what we offer through uh, a lot of these academy schools <coughs> is offering a better education, a good education, an education 
that people um, um, uh, uh, aspire to through the system. And I can remember <coughs> long after I left Bradford, uh, looking at the Times uh, and, and seeing the education results, and from poor blacks and poor whites and young Asians, we were getting really good results. So I think that we have, in a way, I think in a lot of our inner cities, made assumptions about the capability that people have been allowed to drift away from what they could um, achieve. And good stuff that I've seen run by councils, and I've seen run by conservative councils, I've seen run by labour councils, is one that sees the, the kind of individual and the importance of bringing the best out. And I think that's, that's, uh, that's the way to go. I am, by nature, an optimistic sort of, uh, sort of a chap. I think my experience of, of dealing, running with it in the city, is the vibrant uh, and largely Pakistani population brought to Bradford was one that made that city a lot stronger. Um, who could for one moment believe that the economic strength that Leicester uh, currently enjoys would not have been achieved without the Ugandan Asians. I think we need to kind of understand in a world that is rapidly changing, when emergent e economies are getting stronger, <coughs> the fact that we have people from all over the world is a strength. But in order for that strength to be understood, in order for that strength to be generated, in order for that strength to hold us together, we need to be able to talk together. We need to be able to plan together. And if you'll forgive an old Tory phrase, we need to be able to sell together. Thank you, uh, Secretary of State, uh, uh, for those thoughts. We've been doing some work on what people think about integration, and we've circulated that. But they are focused on it's really, you know. I kind of realise how far we've got to go. What strikes me about the political debate, and also talking to the public, and what we've done, there's a lot of consensus, broad consensus, not everybody like the Lao Tishi, the etc., but on what the foundations are. Um, and in a way, the debate's moved on in that sense. So we can have the debate about how, and if we care a lot about it, how we're going to resource it in tight times. But I'm hoping we can continue to play a role in, in that debate about how we make integration happen. The diversity of our society is a fact, but what we do with that is, is up to us. Policy exchange, I'm sure we'll be doing the same. But thank you very much, Secretary State, for leading this conversation uh, today. And thanks everyone. Could I have just one, one small point? So I want to make it absolutely clear. One of our colleagues up there uh, compared uh, UKIP to the EDL and to, uh, and to racist organisations. I would actually just like to disassociate myself completely. Uh, they're, not the same. they're not the same thing no. by any stretch of the imagination. One's a, a democratically um, uh, elected party and one is definitely not. Thank you, Thank you very much for that. So, everybody, do stay and do stay and have tea and coffee uh, at the end of uh, the mill around. But, but just to ask you all to join me and Policy State in thanking the Secretary of State. So.